Um, our next speaker is Cade, um, who will be also helping us not lose the forest for the trees, and will be the second speaker in this symposium not to use a PowerPoint, um, which is exciting in a way. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Cade Crockford. I work for the ACLU here in town on issues at the intersection of technology and civil rights. Um, I actually want to speak to the comment that was just made first before I get into my remarks, which is that the delay between um, technology and law that uh, governs new technologies, digital technologies, is um, in some way caused by a delay in thinking. And I have been doing this work for almost 10 years now. The work that I do aims to um, update the law to reflect new technologies. And I have to tell you, that the gap between the thinking in terms of you know, how fast uh, technologists are moving and how legal thinkers and advocates are um, thinking about regulating technological systems is shrinking um, fast. That there's a lot of thinking that's going on with respect to how we ought to update the law to reflect new technologies. The problem is a political one. It's not that um, people don't necessarily know what the right ideas are or haven't given these issues enough thought. It's that our Congress is broken, and many state legislatures are not dealing with these issues. Um, and courts, for some reasons that I'll get into, um, you know, can't just decide what issues to take up. They have to wait until they get a case, and oftentimes that takes a really long time. So I, I just want to be clear about that, that, it, that um, it may have been the case 20 or 30 years ago that there weren't very many people working in this space thinking about you know, how we ought to modernize the, the law to reflect new tech. That's really not the case anymore. Um, you just heard from Kendra, who works at an entire institute at Harvard Law School that's dedicated to thinking about new technology and the law. And there are tons of people who do this work all around the country and all around the world. So um, I just want to stress that it's really a political problem. So, okay, I'm going to be talking about um, face surveillance. I use that term uh, intentionally. I don't call it face recognition. That's for a couple of reasons. One is because when people hear the term face recognition, they think, I believe, about um, the idea of matching one image to another, maybe in a set of uh, many millions of images using artificial intelligence or machine learning. There are a lot of other ways that face surveillance takes place. One of those is um, unfolding in, in the People's Republic of China right now, in the Zhenjing province, where we see um, effectively the creation of networks of um, sentient surveillance cameras that are automatically cataloging and um, keeping records of every single person's public movements, habits, associations. That, in my view, is face surveillance. It's not face recognition. And there's another um, form of face surveillance that uh, was also mentioned on the stage just prior, which is affect recognition, emotion recognition. Um, really important research paper came out of Northeastern uh, just a couple months ago over the summer from Dr. Lisa Barrett, who reviewed with a team over a 1,000 papers, um, serious literature review, came to the conclusion that, in fact, it is not possible for human beings to identify how someone is feeling based on looking at their face. So the idea that human beings would be able to teach a machine how to do that um, is not a serious one, uh, and it's actually junk science. So um, keep that in mind, and keep all three of those different types of face surveillance in mind when I talk about face surveillance writ large. So the ACLU, um, for about a year now, has been involved in waging a nationwide campaign to try to bring attention to the dangers that face surveillance poses to a free and democratic society, particularly in its entirely unregulated form, um, which is what we're uh, living with today. And uh, over the past few months has been trying to uh, regulate it, ban it, place moratoriums on the government's use of the technology. So. Um, some of you may know that in May, my colleagues in Northern California were successful in passing the first municipal ban on the government use of face surveillance in San Francisco. Um, I do not think it's an accident that the city in the country that um, is home to the most technology workers, to the most uh, people who work in uh, digital technology specifically, um, was the first city in the country to say not 
in my community. Um, so we followed up shortly thereafter in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is about a mile down the road that way. Um, and Somerville became the second city in the country to ban municipal government use of face surveillance technology. Um, again, many of the people who live in Somerville work in the technology industry in Cambridge. Um, Massachusetts actually has the highest per capita population of tech workers in the country. We have more tech workers than California per capita. We're only six million people here. We're a small state. Um, but many, many people here work in tech and many of the people who live in Somerville um, and who supported the city council's vote to ban the municipal government's use of the technology are themselves technology workers. Um, why is it so dangerous? Well, uh, tech, this technology in the form in which China is using it and in which some US cities, including Orlando, have experimented with, uh, the Detroit Police Department is apparently experimenting with this as well, the use of face surveillance to, again, make sort of sentient all of the millions, actually, of surveillance cameras that um, populate our city streets throughout the United States. This facilitates the mass tracking and cataloging of every person's public movement, habit, and association, not on one day, but on every day, with the push of a button. And that's prospectively and retrospectively. For as long as we have video surveillance footage, you run that through an algorithm connected to a database of uh, images of people and their names and addresses, and you basically have a panopticon in public space. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the um, reference, Jeremy Bentham was a 19th century philosopher who came up with the concept of a panopticon. This was a prison that was designed so that uh, there was a guard tower in the middle, and all of the cells were around the guard tower. The guard could see the entirety of every cell, so a prisoner had no privacy from the guard, and the prisoners could not see the guard because the guard was looking out through a very small slit, small window. So this idea of a panopticon was theorized later in the 20th century by Michel Foucault, who said that modern institutions have effectively internalized the panopticon for us, that we behave as it were, as if people are watching us constantly because our institutions have cultivated that sense of um, obedience in us, effectively. This technology means that the panopticon is not a metaphor anymore. It's real. Um, it, it extends the panopticon out of this sort of like institutional training and the, you know, the theory and into the material reality of our public space. Why? Because police departments, security agencies, in in behind closed doors locations that, that cannot be seen and viewed by the public have the capability of monitoring every single thing that happens in public space, everywhere everyone goes, everything everyone does. Um, so that is essentially the panopticon in, in real life. And if, if you're not sure about why that poses a threat to a free society, um, to privacy, to freedom of speech and association, to pre uh, freedom to worship your religion without government interference, then we can have a conversation later, but I'm just going to assume that most people in the room are familiar with why that's a, a dangerous concept. Um, so is that happening right now in the United States? Well, the, the truth is we actually don't know, and that's part of the problem. Um, for a long time now in the U.S., really since 9-11, so for about... Uh, 18 years, we have seen billions of dollars pouring out of the federal government from the Department of Homeland Security and the, the Department of Justice into state and local uh, law enforcement coffers. They have created with these funds what they call fusion centers. So these are essentially spy centers where state, local, and federal law enforcement collaborate. Um, they have tons of new technology. Some of these new technologies include networked uh, regional, not just urban in one municipal area, but regional surveillance camera networks. So we have, we have one in Boston. It's called the, um, it's called uh, SIMS. I forget what it stands for. Something monitoring system. Um, critical incident monitoring system. And this is a networked surveillance camera system that um, exists in 13 communities, including Cambridge, Somerville, Boston, Winthrop, Chelsea, Revere, um, a whole bunch of uh, communities all around the Boston metropolitan area. I think there are about a million and a half people who live within those communities. And so just through one computer terminal, a police officer or intelligence agent 
who has access to this system can view and manipulate cameras across multiple jurisdictions. So what happens when that system is equipped with a facial recognition or face surveillance algorithm? Um, it becomes easy, for example, to enter the name of a journalist into the database and say, I'd like an alert whenever you see this person walking down the street. Um, you can imagine the, the dangerous consequences there. Again, we don't know the, ex the extent to which that type of surveillance is happening in Massachusetts or the country because most of this stuff takes place in secret, in the dark, uh, decisions made by executive bodies like law enforcement agencies, often even without the knowledge of, of local mayors who are supposed to be in control of local police in the United States. Um, so there's a basic crisis of democratic governance with respect to accountability around local law enforcement. And when you add this technology into the mix, it becomes particularly per pernicious because of how powerful this stuff is. Some people might be thinking, well, what difference is there between you know face surveillance that enables law enforcement to track monitor, identify, et cetera, all people's public movements and public spaces. And these devices that we've been carrying around now for you know 30 years, 20 years at least, um, well, there are a couple differences. One is that I can leave this at home if I want, but I can't leave my face at home. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, over the past two weeks, th there's been a robust debate in Boston about whether we ought to ban the wearing of masks in public space. Um, this comes after a heated protest uh, where some Nazis um, gathered in the Boston Common. A bunch of anti-fascists came and protested them and got in some fights with the cops. And a uh, city councilor has now said he's very upset about these anti-fascists and wants to ban the wearing of masks in public space in Boston. So if this happens, <laughs> you won't even have the option of hiding from an omnipotent face surveillance system that, again, is layered over a networked uh, surveillance camera system like the one that we have in the greater Boston area. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason it's different from cell phone tracking is because we now have a law uh, to protect us from law enforcement obtaining our cell phone location history. Um, without a warrant. And that is a case that my colleagues at the National ACLU, um, Nate Wessler, argued at the Supreme Court and was decided in July of 2018, uh, Carpenter versus the United States. Carpenter, of course, holds that law enforcement, if they want to ask your cell phone company for um, CSLI, uh, it's cell, cell site location information, information your cell phone company holds about where you were last week, last month, last year, they have to go to a judge and get a warrant before they can do that. Why is that important? Well, obviously it's an important privacy and Fourth Amendment ruling. It, it pertains to uh, face surveillance in two ways. One is that that decision was made in 2018. Uh, we used cell phones maybe starting in 1995, something like that. So that's about 30 years, close to 30 years of, um, or 25 years of people using a commercially widespread commercially available technology and law enforcement conducting what the Supreme Court ultimately held to be uh, unconstitutional surveillance on a mass scale all across the country for 25 years. So I would submit that we ought not go down the same road when it comes to face recognition and face surveillance, that we should try to head this off at the pass and not allow 30, 40 years of constitutional violations to occur. Um, the second reason it's critical is that Unlike, um, unlike the, the face surveillance case, there's a really important area of the law when, uh, when we think about surveillance and privacy and technology that is basically just about friction. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can get privacy and keep privacy, and friction is one of those ways. So if a police officer wants to find out where I was six weeks ago, and they weren't conducting real-time surveillance of me, following me around, they actually have to go to the phone company. Even before Carpenter, they would have to go to a third party and issue some sort of legal demand, even if it was less than a warrant, and say, we want this information, right? That's a really necessary protection, civil rights protection. It's an area of friction. Face surveillance technologies, they're not gonna be built externally to police departments. They're going to be built internally, right? So there's a really important legal question here, which is, is it even possible? Is it even plausible that we could create an adequate regulatory regime to govern law enforcement's use of this 
truly dystopian and authoritarian technology if there's no friction there. They don't have to go to any external entity to ask, I would like, to, I would like you to perform a face surveillance search to see if Cade Crockford was in the vicinity of Harvard Law School two weeks ago. They just query their own database in-house. And this, again, is in a system where we have virtually no independent accountability or oversight of what's, what goes on behind closed doors in police departments. So the ACLU, we are making the argument that as a result of this failure, this lack of friction in this case, that type of deployment of that technology, what we're seeing in China right now, the in-house construction of face surveillance networks laid on top of public surveillance camera networks that exist in Metro Boston and in many cities across the country and even small towns in the United States, ought to just be banned. It simply shouldn't take place. There may be some public safety benefit that could derive from the use of a technology like that, but it would be far outweighed by the absolutely guaranteed cost to privacy, anonymity, free speech, freedom of association. So that's one type of use of the technology. There's another though, checking the time. Okay, I wanna leave at least 10 minutes for questions, so I'll wrap up soon. There's another, which is the, the more simple version of uh, face recognition that I described at the outset. You have an image of someone, say somebody's making threats on social media, and you can see their avatar. You want to know who is this person, right? So you maybe take that image and you run it using a face recognition algorithm against the driver's license database or a mugshot database. Um, that's a different type of use of this technology. And I think it's really, really important as we think about how we may allow in a democratic society for law enforcement and other government agencies to use these technologies going forward to distinguish between these different types. So I like to call kind of the China, China version, the, uh, the Zhangjing province, you know, controlling the Uyghurs version, the where, and then this other, you have an image of somebody you want to identify, you want to run it against the database as the who. So again, our position at the ACLU is that the where should never happen. We should ban it outright. Law enforcement should not be able to do that in the United States, period, forever. The who is a separate question. There are obvious circumstances, the Boston Marathon bombing being just one, where law enforcement officials have an image of someone they think is potentially a suspect in a serious crime, right? It could be that they have a still from a surveillance camera of somebody shooting someone. They have no idea who this person is. They try to find out through cell phone location history. There's no cell phone in the area. They, maybe with the appropriate level of judicial authority, or oversight rather, and accountability, would then be able to take that image and go to the driver's license database, some other database, and run the image against that database using a face recognition algorithm to try to determine who that person is. That type of surveillance, the, the who, has been happening in Massachusetts for 13 years in secret. There are a whole host of problems with the unregulated use of that type of technology. And we are um, trying to work right now in the Massachusetts State Legislature to place a moratorium on all government use of both of these different types of technologies so that we can have a very deliberate and thoughtful conversation about how, again, we ought to integrate these technologies into our society if we decide to do so at all. There are some people who are saying we should just ban them both outright. Um, I think that's highly unlikely. I think it's possible that we could actually ban the where, but the who I think is likely to take place in certain circumstances. I would submit that it ought not to be allowed in petty theft investigations or to identify people at political protests or things like that, but that for very serious cases like murder or kidnapping um, with sufficient judicial oversight, with sufficient um, due process requirements, that's the other thing. So I am going to finish now after I talk about due process. Um, we know that, again, this has been happening, the WHO in Massachusetts for 13 years. The RMV, the Registry of Motor Vehicles, has been allowing law enforcement to conduct these searches since 2006. And we started having conversations with public defenders at the Committee for, uh, Committee for Public Counsel Services, CPCS, the State Public Defender's Office here in Massachusetts, about what we've been learning about the use of face recognition in law enforcement, and their jaws dropped. They had no idea. They, you know, I know people who have been litigating murder cases, serious cases at the superior court level, where this type of stuff may actually have been involved in helping law enforcement you know, 
discover that somebody was a suspect in a case and, and go on to investigate and prosecute them. And they're not telling defense attorneys about this. They're not, they're not telling criminal defendants about the use of this technology. And that is a significant due process issue. Um, this is a digital witness, effectively. And a digital witness, like any other witness, um, should be interrogated by the defense if they want to interrogate the witness. There are a whole host of different questions that defense attorneys want to be able to ask of law enforcement if they are using this technology. Among them, what accuracy threshold did you set the technology at? What confidence threshold? You know, was it 99% or was it 70% that returned the result of my client? Um, has the system that you used been audited for racial and gender bias? Just down the street at MIT, Joy Bulamwini's research has shown that multiple systems sold by even very prominent technology companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Face++ are making and selling systems that have high rates of misclassification, particularly for black women, up to 35% uh, for black women, whereas they work almost 99% of the time for white men. So if those systems are being used in a criminal context, a defense lawyer definitely wants to know about that. And, and right now, they're being denied the opportunity to even interrogate those systems at all. So um, I talked a lot. I'm happy to take any questions. We only have like five minutes. Uh, thanks, Cade. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your take on the home doorbell systems that police are now encouraging folks to use. I had a couple of incidents in my neighborhood where there were serious crimes. One, uh, an attempted arson on a synagogue. A second was a witness intimidation for someone that was uh, in a local hearing. In both instances, the police came forward and, and asked neighbors, can you provide ring alarm data that we might use in this investigation? Amazon produces it. Amazon has this sort of technology. I don't think they've hooked up facial uh, uh, recognition, but it's certainly that sort of panopticon thing that you're talking about that's starting to happen. And of course, the police are encouraging people to, to engage in it. So I'm really of mixed minds, right? I mean, it's it's it helps solve at least one serious crime, but also there's some concerns around it. So I'm wondering about your take. Yeah, um, I mean, I find those things to be appalling. <laughs> if I could, if I could wave a magic wand and eradicate all of those devices from the world, I would. Um, you know. I think it's important to think about why we value privacy and why um, we value anonymity in public space and, and why those things are related to freedom of speech and other freedoms that people in the United States appreciate. And frankly, you know, those are freedoms that people all across the world gravitate towards the United States to seek because they are um, absent in some places. I think about the relationship between safety, right, and I intentionally put scare quotes around that because I, I think that a lot of technologies that give us real safety are also privacy enhancing technologies. So I am not someone who agrees that there's a binary um, or there's a dichotomy between privacy and security. I actually believe that privacy and security most often walk hand in hand. Um, so for example, doors, <laughs> those give you privacy and security, locks, give you privacy and security. Encryption, privacy and security. Curtains on your windows, et cetera. There are a number of technologies, fences, right? Privacy and security. Um, technologies that invade our privacy actually don't really advance our security oftentimes. We're, we've been sold a bill of goods by Silicon Valley and the cops for a long time that, that they do. It's not true. <laughs> and um, you can just Google for yourself uh, how easy it is to hack into people's webcams. Maybe Amazon's Ring technology has better, um, you know, wireless security, but it's relatively easy for people to hack into webcams, hack into Arlo systems that, you know, people are putting all over their houses. Um, and then again, law enforcement is not often um, an asset in terms of safety for a lot of communities, right? So the idea that um, self-surveillance is going to keep you safe, I think, um, may be true for rich white people, right? But is not true for uh, low-income communities of color, for immigrants, um, for dissidents, et cetera. It's one way to answer the question. Another is to say, on the specific relationship between security and, um, and liberty, I often think about um, East Germany and the society in, in East Germany, the people who are living under the Stasi, who would rather risk their lives to get shot climbing over the fence 
than they would live in a society that was perfectly safe, but completely authoritarian. So just think about that, right? I mean, perfect safety is not a nice way to live, actually. People would risk their lives and, and rather be killed than live in a society like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We say we value privacy, but then we put everything about our families, our trips, everything up on the web, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Um, is there resistance from the general public, I guess, is, you know, somebody in certain areas, they may be more educated than others. I mean, it's interesting that the technologists um, are the first to say we don't want these, you know, they know the evils of their own creations, I guess. Um, but in society in general, where we are saying, you know, hey, I'm here right now, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. tweeting it. <laughs> so great question. I mean, two things about that. One is that people actually do value their privacy. I think uh, people want to be able to use Facebook and Twitter and Gmail, et cetera, without compromising their um, democracy, for example. So I think a lot of people for a long time have bought the line from Google and Facebook that um, it's fine that you know we are all being surveilled constantly so that we can use Google and Facebook for free. That made sense to people when um, the only thing that somebody was trying to sell us was a pair of shoes, right? Or the boat that you looked at, or the you know the skis that you looked at on whatever website followed you around for six months until you just, like gave in and bought it. Um, that's one thing. The Cambridge Analytica scandal freaked people out, justifiably, because people realized that that huge quantity of information that has been amassed about all of us by companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook can be weaponized. <laughs> to attack our democracy, can be weaponized to elect somebody like Donald Trump as the president, right? And that, I think, both shows the power of information, like revealing how powerful information is. If I know everything about you, I can control everything about your life, right? And so people, I think, had a moment of realization where they realized, like, wait a second, maybe there's a downside to what Shushana Zuboff calls the surveillance capitalist economy, right? Um, so I'll say that. People want to be able to use those services and retain some amount of privacy, and I believe they should, and Congress needs to step up. Again, this is a political problem. Congress should step in and force those companies to, you know, abide by a stronger set of privacy laws, maybe something like what the Europeans have done with the GDPR. And on the other hand, when someone posts a photo to Facebook, they at least are making a conscious choice to do that. What we're talking about, face surveillance stuff that the government is doing, you don't have a choice. When you go to get a driver's license, which many people have no choice about, right? You need a, a government ID. They don't ask you to check a box that says, it's fine with me if you enter my face into a per perpetual face recognition lineup. They don't even tell you that it's happening. They just do it, right? So, you know, on the one hand, I don't want to say... People don't give a shit about their privacy because people do, and we ought to change consumer privacy a lot. But this whole set of circumstances that I'm talking about, it's not about consumer choice at all. It's about government agencies making decisions in secret behind closed doors that impact all of us, and that's unacceptable. And people are upset about it. So you mentioned now, and you mentioned at the beginning as well, that a lot of the reason for the um, well, the delay between technology and law is a political problem, um, issues with the legislatures um, at the federal level and the state. Um, how then do you recommend affecting change now? Is it going through the legislatures? Is it putting pressure on particular parties? What would be the so the face surveillance thing, um, I mean, our strategy is, is to try to get these municipal bans passed. And so we succeeded in Somerville. We're trying to, we're trying to pass one in Cambridge. We're working on uh, other municipalities in Massachusetts and to get this moratorium passed at the state level. And then um, if we can get enough communities across the country and some states to either imp implement moratoriums or bans or very, very strong regulations, um, we're hopeful that Congress will eventually do something. Um, it wasn't always the case that Congress was so... Uh, 
bad, basically. And, you know, reforming our political system is going to require all of us to be more politically engaged at every level, local, state, and federal, to vote, um, to, you know, start to actually step outside of our private lives and realize that the decisions that policymakers are making every day about us are influenced far too heavily by major corporations um, at every level and to try to take some of that power back. So, I mean, the answer to that is really just organizing, which is, you know, hard. <laughs> but if you want to help, let me know. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. <laughs>